hello everybody. <laughs> oh, it's nice to see so many people um, in the waiting room and they're there on the dot of 7.30. That's, that's really encouraging and very nice to see everybody. It would be, yes, if you um, type your name and if, if you can type um, your community group uh, as well as your name, that'd be really great. Um, I think it's, you know, hovering over those three little dots in the top right hand corner and you could put your community group name in there. That'd be just lovely to see where everyone's from. Because we have a different audience tonight because it's in the evening. So um, some people we've not, we've not met before on, on our community meetings anyway. So. Oh, great. Oh, hello, Celia. It's very nice to see you. Hello, you. Kirtlington. Hello, Hugh from Hook Norton Low Carbon. I'm a member of that as well. So it's really nice to see Hugh here. And Nick Smith from Deddington, if I'm not mistaken. Probably got that completely wrong. I might, it's probably Chris Smith. But no, quite uh, right, it's just that's come up on the screen. <laughs> okay. And um, Julia right. from the Low Carbon Hub and Low Carbon Oxford North. Very nice to see you. And Tim Chatterton. I can't see your, your picture, but I think you're from Goring and Streetly, if I'm not mistaken. I am indeed. I'm not on video. I'm recovering from the vaccine. What did you, right? Oh. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, great. Great. Well, I think we might um, make a start. There's quite a lot of people registered, so... Um, I'm not sure if we should just give one more minute. Has one more person already? Look, um, and then and then we'll we'll make a start. So it's the anniversary, I think, today of the um, original lockdown. I think, isn't it? And uh, it's just amazing because you know we started having our, our community um, meetings at that very beginning. You know, um, not this exact day, but at this period last year, because it was such a good way to to keep our communication open and and keep um, you know the climate change message going throughout out the restrictions. But I never for one moment thought that a full year on, we'd still be here. You know, we were wondering, will it be for three months, do you think? Maybe six at the most. Mm. And a year later, you know, here we are. So um, it's really uh, interesting to reflect on that, on that today a bit. Um, see how that goes. Well, 7.33. I think we should probably make a start really. Okay, so welcome everybody to the Low Carbon Hub's cocktail of climate change conversations. So if you haven't um, seen me before, I'm Kathy Ryan, the Community Engagement Manager at Low Carbon Hub. And I'd like to introduce Zoe Tune, our marketing coordinator who's here with me. And this is the latest in our series of community meetings. I've just got a few technical things to get out of the way before we begin. Um, so we are recording the event, but it, it won't be, it's really just for our own purposes and it won't be publicly available to view. But if, if you do want to see it, we can share the link um, to YouTube, um, to our community groups. So if you would like to see it or, or somebody else in your community group missed it, you could email Zoe and I and, um, and we could share the link with you. Um, and once we get going, um, you can type your questions into the chat function, but we will be opening up the discussion to everyone after we've heard from our two speakers. So I think I've already said my next bit actually, but we've been um, meeting on Zoom regularly since the COVID restrictions began, and it's proved a brilliant way to, to keep in touch with all our community groups and to keep the climate discussion open and thriving. And as I said, you know, a year on, I just didn't think that we'd still be here under lockdown conditions, but here we are. And, and hopefully it's not for long, but it's, you just, we just don't really know. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad that we've got this set up. 
And we usually hold our meetings in the morning and, and they've become known as community coffee mornings. But we're aware that not everyone can make that time of day. So we decided to try one in the evening to see if we can include a different group of members. And that's why it's called a cocktail of climate conversations. <laughs> so I don't know whether some people expected us to be in hammocks, you know, sipping actual cocktails. And, and maybe, maybe we should have done that. But um, that's why it's called a, a cocktail evening of climate conversations. Ka -ka -ka. Um, we actually have a lot of people registered tonight, I think, which is a testament to the magnitude of interest in our guest speakers. First, I'd like to introduce Al Kitchen. He's a member of Deddington Environment Network, and Al was also elected as the Low Carbon Hubs Communities Director last autumn. So he represents all our community groups at board level. He's really enjoying being on the board and, and the community side of the roles and attending events virtually, but he can't wait until we get back to real live events and we can actually meet in person, which will be lovely. Um, he worked for several large multinational organizations bec before becoming involved in sustainability, and he's a self-confessed latecomer to that particular party, but better late than never, I say, so I think that's just fine. <laughs> and um, just after he was elected, we were, we were discussing how we might work together, and I asked him if he would like to take over one of our community coffee mornings. And if he did, and he was going to interview someone, who, who would he like to interview? And straight away, he said, Dr. Brenda Boardman, because of her vast wealth of experience and knowledge in the community. And Al is delighted that his wish has come true. And he has a lot of questions he's going to ask Brenda. <laughs> Which brings me to Brenda Boardman. Now, so Brenda is a member of Low Carbon Oxford North and is better known as the person who brought energy efficiency labeling to UK appliances. She was recently voted onto Radio 4 Women's Hour Power List Our Planet 2020, in which they celebrated 30 of the most inspiring women whose work has made a significant contribution to climate change. Brenda is a retired member of the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford after 40 years of research and ca on campaigning on energy use and the growth of fuel poverty. In the last couple of years, she's focused on air pollution, traffic and active travel in Oxford, and still speaks passionately about what governments need to do to ensure the benefits of energy saving are accessible to everyone. I would describe Brenda as a good humoured force of nature and a very nice person. <laughs> and I think the combination of Al and Brenda, we have the ingredients for the perfect cocktail of climate change conversations. So, so let's begin, and we're going to use a sort of um, Q&A format, really, and, but we'll see where the conversations take us. And our, Bren, Bren is going to interview, uh, Al is going to interview Brenda, and then Brenda has a few questions for Al as well. And then after that, we'll open up discussion to the floor. Okay, so without further ado, Al, would you like to begin? Certainly would, and thank you to uh, Brenda for uh, agreeing to uh, take the questions over the next hour or so. And I'm absolutely delighted to have you here as one of our guests and as one of our members. Um, one of the things that I said that I would do uh, is to celebrate our successes. And you know, when we see one of our own um, in one of the most prestigious lists for on Radio 4, uh, we've really got to celebrate that. And that's why, partly why it's a cocktail evening. The other reason this is a cocktail is, is, is it's a mix of things. It's a mix of ingredients that make something better than all of the parts. And those ingredients are a, a wide ranging conversation and also the chance for you to ask your questions. And so we'll, we'll push through some of our, our, our questions um, and then uh, we'll get into a, a wide ranging discussion. And uh, hopefully this will help, help to connect members that haven't spoken to each other before or just uh, reinforce some of those messages uh, and membership friendships. I'd also like to thank Kathy and Zoe for putting on a great program of events, whether it's in the morning or the evening. And uh, with that, I'm going to get going with uh, what is traditionally question one. And uh, we, we've got a couple of easy ones to warm up with. Brenda, what is your favourite cocktail? <laughs> oh, I'm afraid I'm not much of a cocktail drinker. Um, but if I was really pushed, I think I'd say um, that I like a Pims. Um, I particularly like a Pims when I'm sitting in the garden, our lovely little garden, uh, and it's late evening, but still sunny. Well, I think that inspires us with, uh, with something to look forward to. So 
not necessarily in the in the context of cocktails, but uh, to you, what makes a good party? Uh, I I love having a discussion with some friends, um, probably one other or two other couples, uh, friends like Cassie Shock, who's on the uh, on the list at the moment, uh, uh, listening in, um, and and it's really gorgeous just to be able to sit down and relax uh, uh, and have a good chat. Um, and hopefully that's coming soon. In addition, though, I'd say I quite like it when, again, I go back out into the garden. Um, and if uh, we are in the garden, it usually means that it's a barbecue. So John's doing the cooking and I'm not. So that's even better. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. It, it, purely by coincidence, it is uh, one year on from the, the announcement of lockdown. Uh, and I wanted to ask you your thoughts on 2020. Is this a, a, a lost year or one that's been reinforcing what's really important for us and our communities? Um, I think I'll just, uh, there are so many dimensions to that. Um, I'm going to take it from an energy perspective. Um, and I don't think it's a lost year. I think it is quite a transformational year. But the extent to which we, if you like, stay transformed is uh, uncertain. I, th I, I suspect that we're going to continue to Zoom. I think we've all actually quite like Zooming and not traveling. Um, I'm not so certain, but I, I suspect we're all going to, those of us that work or those of them that work, um, will continue to do much more working from home. And that's going to be interesting from an energy perspective because um, you save energy in terms of less commuting. You use more energy if you're heating your home, but you save energy if you've actually closed an office and are no longer heating that. So there's a, on the energy balance, that's quite um, an interesting set of interactions. Um, I think in terms of the last year, uh, it's been very interesting how we've all travelled differently. Um, and I think we're all learning to walk and cycle more. Certainly the people with cycle shops or selling bikes say that the, they've never known them themselves so busy. And I really, really hope that that's going to continue. But equally, at the same time, we've got a bit nervous of getting on the bus. And so some people are getting back into the car, whereas they previously go on pub public transport. So in terms of active travel, um, I think the jury is out still, and it rather depends on how much our councils respond. Because the thing that was so dramatic, I mean, certainly in the first lockdown, just you know, a few weeks time a year ago, the, the change in the roads was just so dramatic. But you could walk along the arterial roads, the main roads, Banbury roads, Woodstock roads, whatever, and, and, and nobody bother. There's no cars there. And as everyone talked about, you know, the birds singing and being able to smell the flowers and not be suffocated with pollution. So I hope that we can go back to something like that. But, and it's really a shame that so much traffic has increased again. The one, the one um, just before, um, I was listening to the uh, five o'clock news and um, there was a, they were having a discussion again about you know, the last year. And I think one of the issues that's quite interesting is we've learned and increasingly we're learning that Britain can't deal with vaccination alone. We've got to talk to and work with all of the other countries around the world because even if we all got vaccinating, vaccinated, sorry, um, there's still the possibility of the, the COVID coming back because some other country hasn't achieved as much and hasn't got everybody vaccinated. And that's a, a direct parallel with the problems on climate change. Yeah. So I, I'm, there is a sort of selfish us versus uh, an unselfish everybody debate about vaccination and about climate change. And I don't think we've worked this one through enough yet. That's a really interesting point on the, you know, uh, no one's safe until everyone's safe. And uh, that, that does mirror that. We're, we're going to come on to some of the, the, the other things that you've mentioned there in a little bit more detail in a little while. But I wanted to take you back to um, where you started and where a lot of your work has come through. 
and that's over 40 years of work and, uh, <laughs> and you know an impressive catalogue of uh, work that's gone on there and that's around fuel poverty and after 40 years of working on that what, what's your opinion of where we stand um, and the progress made and the progress left to to make on fuel poverty? <laughs> Again, uh, Al, it's a really difficult set of interactions. Um, at one level, uh, we've made fantastic progress. Um, I, I, I looked up my first book, which was based on my doctoral thesis, and um, one of the quotes that I put at the beginning of that, which was from 1985, and it was Peter Walker, who was then Secretary of State for Energy, and he said, I am afraid that I must take issue with the term fuel poverty. People do not talk of clothes poverty or food poverty. And I do not think it is useful to think of fuel, talk of fuel poverty either. That was, <laughs> that was what I was battling against when, when I started back uh, doing my doctorate in 83, uh, 88. Um, and yes, I was a late developer. Uh, but and just, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, I was part of an international group uh, looking at fuel poverty, and it is now spread from England uh, right around Europe. It, most uh, member states are now looking at the problem of fuel poverty. And there were 432 people in this conference. It's a four-day conference, 400 people. So there's a fantastic legacy there. The subject is getting known, it is getting spread. In some ways, of course, it's bad news that more and more countries are finding it. Um, and I've always said that they, are, they will find it if they look for it, and previously people hadn't looked for it. So at one level, uh, the legacy is good. And a lot, a lot of uh, the people that are on that are youngsters, uh, which is also excellent. So there's a, there's a new cohort of researchers coming through um, another good sign is temperatures in people's homes are so much warmer. Even, the, even some people uh, still have them horribly cold, but by and large, there's, um, we've got much warmer homes. You know, you hear of people talking of ice on the inside of the windows when they were young, and, and we don't get things like that so much now. So we are making progress. But actually, another of the effects of COVID has been to considerably deepen poverty in this country. And therefore, I think we've considerably exacerbated the problem of fuel poverty. And we'll increasingly see that people with much less income, um, that somebody was talking about a tsunami of problems waiting for when furlough ends and when protection of people in the privately rented sector ends. So uh, there's still a huge amount to do. And I do in my most depressed moments sort of ask people, uh, <laughs> have I spent 40 years doing nothing? But in my brighter moments, I think it's probably better than if I'd not been here. So where, where can you see us being in, in the next 40 years? So projecting forward, uh, and it was great. We had a conversation with Zoe before about uh, uh, a generational uh, take, taking on of the baton. Um, where, where do we, maybe not in the next forty years, but the next ten years? Where do we see that going? Where do you see it going? What just on fuel poverty? Fuel poverty in particular. There used to be, oh, there used to be a big debate along the lines of um, to solve climate change, we couldn't tackle fuel poverty. The fuel poor are cold. And so therefore, if you improve their homes, they're going to be warmer, but we're not going to have done uh, anything to help with climate change because we won't have saved energy. They, they, they won't have saved energy, they'd just be warmer. Um, that battle has now been uh, annulled, I suppose. Um, and it is recognized, I think in, in most places, that we have to tackle fuel poverty and climate change together. So perhaps, because there is greater and greater urgency over climate change, perhaps we'll get better at dealing with the fuel poor. But the, the, the real problem with fuel poverty is that the people with the lowest incomes should have the most energy efficient properties. It is totally 
counterintuitive. Mm. They are the ones without the money. They are the ones without the capital. Uh, if they're in rented accommodation, they are the one without, ones without the legal rights. And yet they should be super energy efficient. So we, we've, we've got, it's one of the reversals that we've got to do. We've, we, we've got to start making people realize that greater energy efficiency and the lowest incomes have got to go hand in hand. But just talking about reversals, I'm probably going to digress a bit here, but um, we, we've done some odd things in the past. We give people who fly a lot frequent flyer vouchers. We encourage them to fly more. Uh, we should be doing absolutely the opposite. We've been giving huge subsidies to people, uh, companies that, that, that go and mine for fossil fuels. And we should be doing completely the opposite. We should be giving the subsidies to the renewable energy industry. So we are beginning to realize that we've got a lot of things rather wrong. Interesting. I was just listening to Mark Carney today, uh, obviously he's promoting his new book, but uh, you know, can the market sort it? it and uh, it depends on what we value. Uh, and uh, yes, it's a whole other discussion, but yes, there are some odd behaviors that are going on there. So I, I, I know that uh, you're involved in the Coalition for Healthy Streets and Active Travel, as you, you, you uh, alluded to earlier. Um, can you paint as a, a, your vision for the city of the future and not just necessarily the, the, the house or home of the future? And uh, I guess in, in uh, the, the context of COVID, we're seeing a change in the high street. Uh, we use, we're going to see the change in building stock use and other things. But in broad brushstrokes, what, what do you see the, 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 the city or the, the town of the future being? Well, if you just look at our homes, um, they'll probably look almost identical. Um, something in the region of 95% of the homes that have been uh, lived in today will still be in existence in 2050. Um, I, I won't do, a, I won't do a, a poll or anything, but I'd, I'd like to ask everybody listening how long they think the property they live in will stand from the date it was built to the date it, it was pulled down. And if you ask most people that question, they come up perhaps slightly unthinkingly with the stock answer. Well, you know, mortgages and things are assuming properties are going to live, be there for 60 years. Um, well, actually, we virtually never pull our houses down in this country. Uh, we've got 27 million properties. We pull down something in the region of 20 or 30,000 a year, and they're not the worst ones. They're the people up Woodstock Road. <laughs> Excuse me, Kathy, not you, but your neighbours. Um, the people in Woodstock Road who have got large gardens, they pull down the house and they put two back. Uh, and that's the, uh, almost the, the, the main sort of demolition that we do. So the houses that we live in today are going to be the houses that people will be living in in, in 30, 40 years time, almost without exception. And along the same lines, the streets that we walk along and cycle along today will be the same streets in many cases. Um, one, one of the interesting debates is very definitely, and this is a, a rife debate in Oxfordshire, um, the extent to which we want to have many more new homes and if we have many more new homes and huge numbers are being discussed, um, I mean, to the extent that the number of properties in, in uh, Oxfordshire could double by 2050 in, in, um, in some scenarios, the worst scenarios in my mind. But if we're going to build all these new homes, how are people going to travel around? Are we going to, are we going to reduce the number of cars, which we want to do because of congestion and pollution, reduce the number of cars for climate change purposes. But how do we do that when we're building all these new homes? Um, are we going to build somewhere out in Ainsham which has no garages? It's a car free, car independent um, development. <laughs> We've got some left hands and right hands here that are not talking to each other. Yeah, I think we talked uh, very briefly before about 
um, the, uh, the, the transfer to EV vehicles replacing fossil. Um, and uh, you were holding the opinion that that's actually not the, it, it's part of the, the problem, but it's not the crux of the problem. It's if you go back to sort of Henry Ford's time, it's a faster horse, uh, but it, it, it doesn't get the vehicles off the streets. Well, actually, I don't know that it's a faster horse, Al. I think it might be an electric bike. <laughs> Uh, but that, that's right. I mean, the, the, if, if we replaced every car with an electric vehicle, we would get rid of a lot of the pollution, by no means all of it. Um, we'd still get a lot of those small particles, the PM10s, as they're called, and the PM2.5. We might even get more of those because they come from brakes and uh, tyres ru uh, rubbing against the road and things like that. And an electric vehicle being heavier is going to produce more of them. But um, if we, if we um, manage to uh, not replace every car with an electric vehicle, that will be much, much better for congestion. Because as, as implied, we've got a lot more cars possibly coming with a lot more households. Uh, so congestion could be much worse. Excellent. Uh, changing um, thought a little bit. Uh, you've had lots of experience of collaboration and working with multiple agencies and uh, a lot of the things that you've said thus far and in conversation are that invariably pro problems aren't single source or single answer and uh, um, uh, again what's 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 your learning uh, on working with multiple agencies and uh, uh, it's a necessary evil uh, how, how can you what, what advice would you give to people um, who find themselves in that situation and uh, what have you learnt over the last 40 years? Well, with both active travel and with fuel poverty, um, if you're dealing at a political level, um, divided you fall, united you stand. And uh, one of the things that we've done in COSAT, the Coalition for Healthy Streets and Active Travel, um, we've brought together 10 groups of pedestrians, cyclists, Friends of the Earth, Civic Society, etc., uh, uh, as well as Low Carbon Oxford North and Low Carbon West Oxford. And we're, we're working to make sure that we all agree on responses to political documents, consultation documents on connecting Oxford or zero emission zones or whatever they are. Um, because if we've got a problem and we can work it out between the 10 of us, and then all 10 of us reply in the same way, that is infinitely more powerful than 10 slightly varying contributions. And we've learned the same with fuel poverty, there's an end fuel poverty coalition, uh, and uh, that's got 34 organisations, and uh, we, we, we just begin to debate and discuss, and it's not easy, there are often occasions when we, we aren't sure what we should be doing, um, uh, but working it out together is a very, very good um, response. It was, it, I was part of a Zoom earlier this morning with the um, Centre for Sustainable Energy in Bristol, and they've done a lovely project recently called WAM, which is Warmer Homes Advice and Money. And they've done two things which I think are really good. They've got three agencies, the money, the advice and the energy efficiency, uh, working together very closely and working together in each other's offices uh, rather than each of them seeing the householder separately. They have a one nominated caseworker, there's only two, but they have one nominated caseworker who is the interface with the, with the householder and these, four, these three agencies. And I just like this, this, uh, this, this one person, um, uh, one stop shop type approach. And also that the agencies work together rather than expecting the client, uh, the, the fuel poor household, to get in touch with them all individually and separately and get confused and not make all of the contacts. So again, it's, uh, uh, that's a very successful way of agencies working together. And, and how does that sit then with um, compromise or, you know, there's a, a principle of disagree and commit. 
Um, and uh, Chris Voss wrote about, you know, never compromise. Compromise is me wanting to wear black shoes. My wife wants me to wear brown shoes. And so I compromise and I wear one <laughs> black one and one brown one. What, how, how do you see compromise, and so especially across 10 organizations or heaven knows 32 organizations? How, how, how do you get to that, that, that position? Yeah, well, you see, there is, there is some compromise, but it's usually required as, as a result of debate. So it's not so much compromise as getting better understanding with each other. Um, and in both the two examples I gave, with both fuel poverty and active travel, there's a very strong core binding agreement between the groups that they know what they want. It's just how to go about it. Excellent. Um, I, I think the only thing um, that uh, Kathy may have missed in your introduction and has saved it for me is, is I, uh, my question is from the New Year's Honours list, uh, Dr. Brenda Baldwin, MBE, through to the Women and, uh, Women's Hour Power List for the Planet. Um, what access does that give you? And, and I, I know we, just in case anybody is in any doubt, we did talk about the questions in advance. So try and give you a, a good conversation this evening. Uh, and I said, my original question was, you know, have, has a bathroom specially opened up for you at the BBC? What access do you get to special things? And you said, well, nothing, because we haven't been able to go out. Um, so, so if it hasn't happened already yet, what do you hope it's going to give you uh, access to and the ability to do, apart from being called into Zoom calls like this on a Tuesday night? Um, public awards and, and uh, the two you mentioned, the MBE and the, the, the BBC um, Women's Hour list. And there is a third one, which I'm very proud of, which is the Energy Institute's Milk Chip Medal. Um, uh, They've, they've, they're very, they're lovely to have. Uh, in all three cases, they were unexpected. I didn't have to nominate myself or anything like that. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm not certain quite how much. They've given me a lot of extra status. They've given me a bit of extra status. I think being at the University of Oxford gives you some extra status. It's a very nice thing to have on your net your, your um, address. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know that I expect much more to come from it. I mean, it was such an honour with the, with the Women's Hour, uh, you know, to be, to be, I was number 14 and number one was Caroline Lucas, and definitely one of my heroes. Um, I, I don't think I've ever heard her say anything that isn't utterly sensible uh, and appropriate. So it was, it was a deep honour to be part of that group, but um, we, I think much so far has come out of it. Maybe you're right after a they, they, We were meant to be having cocktails, I think, all of the four, 30 of us, but of course we haven't yet. Come on, the BBC, they can organise that. <laughs> they, they, they've got the ability to, to do that remotely. Um, just as a little spur, um, as you, you mentioned politics, um, elections in May. What's your what's your word to the, this audience, or your words to this audience on upcoming elections? Well, especially with my travel hat on, I'm not so good on uh, the county and its policies on housing. But with my travel hat on, as I said, we've got some left hands and right hands really not talking to each other. Um, and if we want active travel, if we want less congestion, if we want less pollution, um, can we really? Uh, have more homes. Um, so I would encourage everybody to ask their candidates questions about the future and how they see it, uh, how the candidate sees it, and whether it's what you would like to vote for. And just to um, uh, plug, um, COSAT is sending out, uh, I think we've got to 12 questions to every single candidate. Uh, in the county elections and in the three districts that are having elections. And we're going to put those answers on our website from the uh, 19th of April onwards. The, the candidates get announced on the 9th of April and the election is the 6th of May. So we have quite a tight timetable uh, during which we've got to send out a questionnaire, get their answers and get it onto the website. 
um, so that we can, we, we hope it will show up some variation. You know, we're asking people about their attitudes to should there be less parking in urban areas. Um, uh, do they want to see any major new roads? We know Expressway has now been cancelled, um, but that doesn't mean to say all of the component parts have been, have been cancelled. Um, and in addition to the COSAT, so that C-O-H-S-A-T, if somebody is looking for our website, um, Low Carbon Oxford North and the um, Communities for Zero Carbon are doing another questionnaire, which is more about uh, housing and biodiversity. And that's going to be also on Elcon and other people's sites. And I suspect that Cathy will do her usual wonderful uh, uh, networking and let everybody know that these are around. But just, just I mean, <laughs> with, now with climate change, we have got such a short window of opportunity. We've got to do so much. You know, as, as I was saying earlier, we've got to completely reverse some of the things that we've been doing in the past and have a completely new attitude. Um, and and uh, if we don't start getting the politicians that deliver for us, that's our fault for not voting for them. Great. And Adam, I'm sure Cathy will uh, be providing suitable links uh, to the, the key points or any, any other things that we need to after this. So I, I wanted to take the, the next couple of questions together and they're, they're around language and accessibility in the green bubble. And uh, as, as Cathy uh, put it in, in the introduction, I'm a latecomer to this conversation. I'm a latecomer to this party. Um, and I appreciate that uh, many, many people on this call are not. Um, you know, we, we, we've got doctors and uh, medical staff can tell us roughly how many calories we should uh, uh, have in our diet. We, you know, we, we roughly know how many alcohol units we should have uh, in our, our lifestyle. Whether we choose to stick to those or not, uh, then that's down to each people. But we, we, we've got some, some language that's accessible to people. And um, I, I, I think you know, the work that you've done with energy efficiency labeling is one of those things that at least people can say, is it good or is it bad? Is it good? You know, and, uh, and but then when we go beyond that, when we go beyond, um, I think the, you know, the, 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 the very educated uh, audience that we've got here, when we go beyond that to the vast majority of people, there is a struggle for language. And, you know, gigawatts, gigawatts, tons of CO2, you know, what's good, what's bad. And, uh, you know, you, you can read and educate yourself about it, but it, it's, it's somewhat still in the abstract for a lot of people, not for the people on this call, but for a lot of people. But the, uh, the, 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 the change is going to make when we can make change mainstream. So I wanted to ask you about how do we go beyond the green bubble? And I, that was a, a, coin, a phrase that I heard coined by somebody else on this call. So I'm not claiming it for my own. How do we go beyond the green bubble? And also, how do we talk across the, you know, from hard green or dark green to, to light green? And how do we bring people on that journey? Uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, if I go back to the experience I've had with working on appliances, uh, and that goes back to 1994, we started at the university in the Lower Carbon Futures Group, looking at the label, energy labels that have become so ubiquitous now on appliances. And we started with fridge freezers. And um, to start with, the, the manufacturers said to us, I don't know why you're going on about um, energy labels. No consumer ever asks us about the energy efficiency of a fridge. No, no consumer would ask because they didn't realize there was a factor of two between the best and the worst. And you didn't know about that until we started labeling them. So quest statement number one, we need to label and to have nice, simple A to G labels on fridges, on televisions, on hoovers, and now increasingly on our houses. Uh, we have to have them when we sell but I think it would be much better if everybody got one ASAP just to find out how efficient their home is 
don't hide behind the fact that uh, it might be horribly inefficient uh, and old and um, that you don't know what to do with it, start finding out. And the second thing, and it also is reflecting what we learned from appliances, uh, there are a whole lot of policies that you can build on a label. You can have a voluntary agreement with the manufacturers, you can have a subsidy for the consumers, but the only thing that actually works is regulation. Mandatory minimum standards. There are no G-rated, F-rated, E-rated fridges, and there haven't been since 1999, because the European Union, bless their cotton socks, um, forbid them. You could not sell them, it was against the, the directive. Uh, so they got phased out and we've done the same with low energy light bulbs. They've all been brought in because we've got rid of incandescence, etc. It was regulation that made it happen. Uh, and I think the same is gradually going to happen with our own homes. It's, it's difficult, um, but we've had grants, we've had encouragement, we've had advertising and uh, advice. And I think increasingly, and the government's beginning to talk about this, we're going to be made to make our homes more energy efficient. Uh, some of the details, of course, have got to be, lots of the details have got to be sorted out, but it is generally, that's where we're working. So in due course, you as, an, as a home occupant will only be living in a property that is more energy efficient. Now, Homes are infinitely more difficult to do than appliances because appliances were done by the manufacturer in the factory and that was all very easy. You just went out and bought it. But we've, and this is where Cozy Homes Oxford of course comes in. We've got to start working with extremely professional tradespeople. We've got to have very good quality advice attached to our energy performance certificate, uh, but it's got to be done with mandatory minimum standards. The government at the moment is saying things like it wants every home, and that's yours, mine and everything, to be a C rated. Um, so that's just down from an A and down from a B, but much better than all the rest, uh, by 2035. <laughs> but it hasn't told us that's what it wants. It's just put it into a couple of, of you know, policy documents that us policy wants know about, but it's not known by the general public. And uh, uh, we've all got to know it. We've all got to know that it's serious and got, we've got to get on with it. And just, even if it feels very confusing, um, you know, as you say, kilowatts and kilowatt hours and all of those uh, lovely different ways of measuring different bits of energy. Uh, I heard somebody from Octopus, the uh, energy company the other day, and she was saying, they have a special tariff that they for people with electric vehicles, and they're quite um, amazed and amused that uh, the people buying electric vehicles, once they've understood kilowatts and kilowatt hours, which they have to in order to charge it up properly and sensibly, then they start getting into the back door, as it were, and looking at energy efficiency in the home. So quite how are we going to get there? Who knows? And I just want to say one other thing. I know I'm running out of time, but... No, no, you're, you're fine. <laughs> Good. Uh, um, I have, I've, with several other people, um, particularly uh, Tina Fawcett at the uh, Environmental Change Institute, have been um, a proponent of personal carbon allowances. The idea that each one of us has, if you like, one tonne of carbon that we can spend each year uh, as a household on the fuels that we put into our home, the fuels that we put into our car, and as it used to be, um, flights that may come back again. Uh, and if you didn't use it all up, you had something to sell. And if you wanted to go to Australia and you hadn't got enough, you had to go onto a market and buy it. Now, one of the beauties of personal carbon allowance is that everybody gets one. So we all have to start thinking in a completely different way and recognizing the issues. But more especially, uh, the people who will not use up their total allowance are the poorest people. The poorest people don't fly. 
the poorest people are much less likely to own a car. Uh, it doesn't apply completely to everybody, but uh, that's the, the general rule of some. So that the people who will have something to sell are the low income groups. And the people that will want to buy something are the higher income groups. So the market would be the better off, you and me, Al, maybe buying something that um, has been sold by um, a disadvantaged household. Fascinating, and uh, that 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 question certainly triggered a couple of uh, points in the chat around uh, EPCs and where we can go for those. And again, um, I'm sure Kathy will send out the links to the information that is in there. Um, last question from me, uh, and then I do want to leave some time for other people. Um, there are many challenges out there, but the the, the top say three challenges for 2021 and beyond, um, if you could put them into a, a cocktail conversation, um, you know, what, what, are, what, what are your, I'm, I'm loath to say what are your burning issues, but what are your, um, what are your most pressing issues? I think, first of all, I'd say everybody has to do We've all got to recognize that this is our responsibility. Um, it's our actions, it's when we turn on the ignition or we switch the light switch that are causing climate change. So it's our actions can do a lot to reduce the threat and the impact. We have got to change as quickly as possible. Just to give you an example, we, uh, John and I, have decided we got to do something about our diet and we're not vegetarians or vegans. Uh, we were big meat eaters and about two years ago we stopped eating beef and then uh, and we managed that for a year we, and then we decided well okay what can we do next and we've done uh, something which has worked really quite well. We will not eat meat on consecutive nights so that in between our two meat eating nights, we either go vegetarian or we have an egg dish or we have fish. Increasingly, we have fish thanks to the Summertown market. Um, and that, so we've, in two years, we've halved our meat consumption. That's not a big deal, but it, it does make us feel a bit better and it, it does give us something to build on. So, wait a minute, I've got, have I got to find three things, Al? Well, there's number one um, is do something. Do something, take own actions and uh, take, take, take small steps is what it's I'm right. hearing from that. I suppose the next one is engage with the politicians. Because although there's a lot that you and I can do as individuals, there's a lot we can't do. For instance, making um, energy labels on houses mandatory. Um, so engage with the politicians, make sure they know that you're concerned about climate change make sure that you know you're uh, listening to what they say and what they do. We've got several politicians around who've got wonderful rhetoric and very little actions. So that's number two. Well, number three, join a community group like Elcon, Elco, Low Carbon West Oxford, Deddington, Cook Norton or whoever, and help your fellow uh, neighbours do something. I, I must just say for, for impartiality, other uh, sustainability groups are available. Yes. <laughs> yes, and you can always start one off as well, if they're not. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, so, you know, own your actions, understand them, be accountable and uh, start to do things differently. Engage politicians and join a group. Have I got those as your 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 three things. Um, before we open up the floor to broader questions, um, I think you had a couple of questions for me, um, but I do want to make sure that we give uh, the, the the floor uh, plenty of time to pick your brains, uh, debate, uh, and engage with you, Brenda. Yes, well, I think it's quite fascinating that somebody like you, who's got a history of dealing with huge, large, international, well-funded projects, actually starts looking at communities. And I don't quite understand why you've made the switch. 
Um, I was uh, I was flying too much. I was not uh, being sustainable, and uh, I started to have more conversations. Uh, and rather than just go, oh, it's too difficult or it's too late, um, I got uh, uh, into. Uh, conversations with uh, people like Christopher Hall and Nick Smith in Deddington and we decided to take some small actions um, and then I just just uh, uh, put myself forward for the community's director role um, thinking that some of the skills that I've learned in large corporate can be applied to change in uh, our communities and our approach to the planet and, and change starts with me and uh, you know I realized I was part of the problem and I needed to get on to the being a bit more of a part of the solution. And which skills have been most useful? I think uh, uh, so I've got I've got certificate and everything in change management and, uh, um, uh, and it really is it, it is is it is about that because we can understand what's right to do and we understand what we need to do but unless change is landed uh, within the, the the, the wider community and organ and, and uh, uh, w the wider community, um, it's not going to have impact. And so the science behind change and change management uh, is is interesting to me, and it's something that I do professionally. Um, and so I, I think I bring that, and I bring a certain amount of facilitation, and uh, hopefully being able to put together interesting interviews with people like yourself. <laughs> All right, my last question to you. What was the most uh, uh, surprising thing I said? Um, I, I, I don't think there were many things that were, were totally surprising uh, of what you said. I think the, uh, the one that's the, the, the most interesting one for me is the personal carbon allowance. Um, and uh, then how do you get to a carbon trading scheme for that? Uh, and then you know it's a it's a, uh, a a right and an obligation that everybody has. How do you get people to um, transform and change the way that they think about that? Uh, 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 and, and again, the, the the things about the the market shaping and uh, uh, and for uh, the the invisible hand of the market uh, uh, changing things is really interesting for me because I think that's where. Uh, we will start to see change at mass scale. That's a, a footnote to that, if I'm allowed. Um, yeah. Well, I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, there's, a, there's a very interesting debate within personal carbon allowances about the extent to which the word allowances and the psychology of an allowance is more important to people than being able to trade. But that's a separate debate.